again, I, I always feel like there should be a dramatic entrance, but I don't want to be too over the top. Um, <laughs> good morning. Um, it's great to be here with you all this morning. I thought this morning I would start out doing something a little different. I'd like to tell you about a story called The Little Red Hen. Now, um, if you're a parent or you, you might know this story. We actually at our house have a couple different versions of it. It's been around for a long time. It's a, kind of a classic fable. This is, um, we had a little golden book and then my son in kindergarten brought this one home. So, so it's, it's a little bit different versions along the way, but the same message overall. And I thought this would be very fitting for what we're talking about today. Now I'm not gonna read the whole thing word for word. I'll probably, I'll just summarize it a little bit for you in case you don't know the story. See, there's this little red hen, and she lives on a farm. And she decides one day she's going to bake some bread. Now, being a hen on a farm, she can't drive to the store and buy bread. She can't buy the ingredients to bake the bread. She actually starts all the way from scratch, you know, straight with planting the seeds. She actually has the seeds. So we're, we're not talking a day-long process. We're talking, you know, probably like months. Um, and on the farm, there's also some friends. There's a cat and a pig and a lamb. And so the little red hen decides she's going to get to work so she can bake this really <coughs> awesome loaf of bread. And so she starts with the planting. Now, she decides to invite her friends to join her in the work. She says, hey, would you guys like to help me plant these seeds? And of course, you know, seeing that it's work, maybe it was hot out that day, the cat, the pig, and the lamb all look at each other and say, nope, not me. <laughs> and it kind of continues this way every step of the process. When she gets to the next point of being able to harvest the wheat after it grows, she invites them again. Who will help me harvest the wheat? And they all say, not I. <laughs> so she, every, each and every time, she says, okay, I'll do it myself. She's not waiting for them to help her. She's, she's going forward. Uh, and, and again, it just continues all through the process. She harvests it. She has to take it to the mill to turn it into flour. Then she has to bring it back home so that she can make it into dough. And eventually, she gets to the point of baking the bread. Now again, every time she's getting turned down, none of her friends want to help. So she's doing it all herself. And we're going to pick up here at the end. I'm going to read you the end of the book to see how it turns out. <laughs> so she's finally baked the bread, right? And here we start. Soon the house was filled with a delicious aroma of freshly baked bread. Drawn in by the smell, the three friends knocked on the window. How convenient, right? The little red hen opened the window and asked, who will help me eat this freshly baked bread? She's just toying with him. And of course, right now, they're all ready. They're all about it. I will, says the pig. I will, said the lamb. I will, said the cat. And guess what she says? Oh, no, you won't, <laughs> said the little red hen. You didn't help me plant the kernels, water the seeds, harvest the wheat, or mill it. You didn't help me make the dough or bake the bread. Therefore, only my baby chicks and I will eat this delicious loaf of bread. That was nice, she's sharing with her kids. But soon after that, the little red hen found some corn kernels in her yard. But this time, all her friends from the farm helped her plant the kernels, water the seeds, sorry, I'm not very good teacher, harvest the corn, and make delicious cornbread. Mmm, cornbread. Once it was done, they celebrated together and ate the cornbread with some scrumptious hot chocolate. <laughs> so, what lesson have we learned from this story? It's important to help others if you want to share in the rewards of hard work. So, you know, like Adam said, we've been talking about being invited through this series. And you've been invited to church, and you've been invited to faith, and this week you are invited to serve. And service can be a little bit touchy to talk about because we don't like to generally do a lot of extra hard work. <laughs> it's not really our human nature. I mean, let's, let's be real. Who wants to work? No. Um, it's, it's touchy because we don't like it when people ask us to give up things, give up our time. But I thought today as we dive into this, we would look at it from 
this perspective from the moral of this story of how it's important to help others if you want to share in the rewards of hard work. So let's pray as we get into this more. So Father, I just thank you for um, today. And I just pray that you speak to the hearts of the people here today. And, um, and God, we just really hear your heartbeat on this. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what is service? Well, when I looked in the dictionary, it gave me a definition. It said it's the action of helping or doing work for someone. It also defines it as a system supplying a public need. So, key words that I kind of took from that are working, action, and helping. Right? Those are all doing. Now, what does the Bible say about service? Well, Jesus, in Matthew 20, 26 through 28, puts it like this. You can open your Bibles. I'm going to read it off my notes. So, But this is not your calling. You will lead by a completely different model. The greatest one among you will live as the one who is called to serve others. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> because the greatest honor and authority is reserved for the one who has the heart of a servant. For even the Son of Man did not come expecting to be served by everyone, but to serve everyone, and to give his life in exchange for the salvation of many. So it's important to give some context here with this verse. You see, what was happening right before Jesus said this is the disciples were in a bit of an argument. See, they were kind of in this process, like Jesus was their leader, right? They already kind of accepted him as the head guy and we're going to follow him. But, you know, whenever there's a leader, there's always that, that need to kind of elevate ourselves and be who can be his best friend, who can be his second in command. Um, and so that's what they were arguing about. They were kind of getting upset, like, who, who was going to be the best among them? And they were really worried about this. And so that's why he comes in and kind of shoots them down. Like, none of you. It's not going to work. You're all on the same playing field, so let's just stop that right now. <laughs> See, we can relate to that in some ways because people are very celebrated by our success today. We, we tend to have that nature of wanting to elevate ourselves and put ourselves number one or number two or, you know, whatever your cause is. And, you know, we have social media to help with this. We can see just how likable we are. We can get a thousand followers. Now, those are not necessarily bad things on their own. Um, I mean, Jesus had a lot of followers. Um, <laughs> so th those are not, you know, and success in, in itself is not necessarily a terrible thing. It's not bad to be good at what you do or how you do it. But Jesus, you know, he, he was trying to put them in their place. He was saying status is not what we're all about. So your calling is not what is meant to make you, is not meant to make yourself great. And of course, there's no such thing as that's not my job when you're in the kingdom of God. So we are all called to serve. And we can't assume that somebody else is going to do it first. Good. See, it's not just that we want to do a nice thing. And Jesus wasn't just talking about, like, a little bit of volunteering here and there. See, that's good. Don't get me wrong. Volunteering is a good thing. You know, we have some free time on a Saturday. Maybe go help Habitat for Humanity, build some houses. Or I have, I have a little bit of time. I'll go um, pack some Thanksgiving boxes at the church. Those are good things, and that's part of it. But it's so much more. So go back to that dictionary definition based on those key words like work and helping and action. You might notice that service is really more of a sacrifice. See, it wasn't meant to be a casual thing. Jesus wasn't talking about just casually giving up a little bit of time here and there to help someone out. He was talking about this is your life. It's meant to be messy. It's meant to be inconvenient. And Jesus never apologized for it. He, I mean, he called us to be servants, and he did it unapologetically. Right. And I think that's something we don't do very well in the church. We tend to apologize a lot for things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do it regularly. You know, can, can you please help in the nursery? <laughs> don't have enough people? <laughs> please, somebody, we need, we need more. 
We apologize when we ask for things. I really don't want to bother you, but could you pray for me? Why are we apologizing when we ask for help, when service is our calling? That's good. Remember when Jesus first called his disciples? You know, he was just walking along, saw him fishing, and in Matthew 4, it says, Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. It said, come, follow me. It didn't say, hey, hi guys, would you like to come check out my small group? <laughs> I mean, no pressure. If you have the time in your week, I know things are really busy. Um, but, and, and we'll try not to be too weird, of course. You know, we don't, we don't want to scare you away. No, no, that wasn't Jesus, right? He was, are you in or are you out? I'm going. You can come, and I'll show you what I do. Or you can stay and keep fishing. That's your option. In Matthew 10, we see it again. He sent his disciples out. He was, he was gonna, getting ready to send them out. Go, go and share my good news. He didn't say, if it's not too much trouble, and if you have some time in your schedule this week, would you please share my good news? Would you tell people about what's going on here? Because I think it's important, but I don't know if you think it's important. No, he said go. Go and announce that the kingdom of heaven is near. Go. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Remember we talked about that a little while ago too. Do these things. In Matthew 14, Jesus was preaching to the masses. He had a crowd of people, like 5,000, just sitting there listening to him. And his disciples notice it's getting late. People are getting hungry. And he's, they say, hey, you better stop talking now and send these people home because I think they're getting hungry and we don't want to be responsible for that, right? Like, what does Jesus say to them? You see the need? You do it. You feed them. We don't have to go anywhere. Take care of it. He wasn't, he wasn't waiting, you know, he wasn't sending them back, you know. He, he wanted them to take care of the need right now because that's what service is. Service is right now. See, when Adam and Corey decided to come to Bloomington and plant this church, they felt a call from God. And they said yes to it. And then they said, okay, we're going. Who's coming with us? They didn't have a sales pitch lined up or recruitment tactics. They didn't have money to pay anybody. <laughs> they still don't. No. <laughs> they couldn't, you know, offer you a great starting salary if you come, you know, poor Alex sitting back there. He's not going to pay. <laughs> they didn't offer him a starting salary. <laughs> they just said, hey, we're going. This is our mission. This is our vision. Come with us. And as a result, many people, myself included, my family included, uprooted our lives. We changed our direction, changed our course of action to come and be a part of that vision and that mission. We dropped what we were doing. People changed jobs, you know, bought houses or rented apartments. When it was time to, like, actually move, you know, my, Brad and I, our, my husband, we moved into a house here. And many people rearranged their schedule and dropped what they were doing to come and help us. They used their time and their physical bodies to help us move heavy things into our house. Yeah. They saw the need and they moved to action. Mm -hmm. Service is also just an outward expression of our faith. Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at it from the point of view of James in James 2, 14 through 20. So... Again, I'm reading off my notes. You're welcome to open your Bibles. But it says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your good deeds, by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, Goodbye. Have a good day. <laughs> Stay warm, eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? Nothing. 
Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop right there for a second and I'm gonna, I'm gonna break it down for you. So this example is kind of the same concept as, say you see a mess on the ground. You know, maybe you see some trash on the side of the road. You see a mess in our, in our commons, our cafe. Um, even if you wanna get really gross, I'm gonna go there. You're in a public restroom, right? And there's always somebody who doesn't flush the toilet. And that's really all you need to make that a usable toilet again. Somebody just to go by and flush it because somebody didn't. Yeah, I know. But you think, I hope somebody takes care of that. Guess what? You are someone. <laughs> See, in the vineyard, we operate from the everybody gets to play position. Right. Yeah. And we try to keep it really simple. Obviously, there are very simple tasks you can do, picking up messes, you know, holding open a door, whatever. We, we try to keep it very simple. Um, we actually, you know, you may have noticed we have a ministry fair going on today. We've made it very easy for people to sign up to be involved here inside this building. And usually we don't make you jump through a lot of hoops to do so. There are, of course, certain exceptions. Some jobs require a little more. You know, we require background checks of all of our kids' teachers. That's just a safety standpoint that that we have. Um, if you've never played an instrument or sang a note in your life, worship team might not be the best choice for you. <laughs> but if you really have a heart for it, I'm sure we can find something. Yeah. But overall, we make it really easy to help, to jump in, to serve. And we provide the trainings if trainings are needed. You know, we, we don't want to complicate it, and we don't want you to have to reach some standard level of something. We want to make it easy, because everybody gets to play. So let's keep going. All right, in verse 17, it says, So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Mm. I will show you my faith by my good deeds. So let me confess something to you. <laughs> All right, now, I am the Family Life Director. And when I accepted this position, I really had to pray about it and really think it through. Because I'll tell you, all my life, one thing that I've said is, I don't want to work with kids. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Don't put me off the stage yet. Hear me out. <clears throat> now, don't get me wrong. I like kids. I have kids. I have four of them. I don't dislike them. But I was never the teenager who was like, let me babysit all your children. I was like, I don't know how to entertain kids. I don't craft. <laughs> so... <laughs> So not that I didn't like them, I just didn't know that I knew how to interact with them. But, okay, again, I have kids, and I can see the value of the ministry that we have here. I see the value in what we're doing. I don't think that we're just babysitting kids. I see the value of what we have going on in our children's ministry. And I realize that that's very important. And so maybe I'm not the best and most qualified teacher. But I'm a physically able-bodied person, who can go back and talk with kids. I can follow the curriculum that we have laid out. Sure, I can do that. And I can craft if I have to, as long as it's really laid out with really specific directions and not too complicated. Yeah. I can do these things because God has given me enough ability to do them. So maybe it's not my calling to be the kids teacher and we have so many gifted teachers that right. thankfully we have so many other people that do it way better than me yeah. but if i need to step back there and step in and teach them i can do that and i can do it to the best of my ability that god has given me so there's no room for me to say like nope I'm not going to do that all right that's just my two cents hopefully hopefully i'm still qualified here <laughs> So let's continue with the last part of the verse, is verse 19, it says, you say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. Wow. So how foolish, can't you see that, without, that faith without good deeds is useless? So they go hand in hand. It's not one or the other. 
Your words have no meaning if you don't back it up with your actions. In 1 Peter 4, it tells us, sorry, getting my notes ready. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Again, everyone has time and talents and resources. Your time is part of your service. The, the resources you have, your home is part of your service. The money you have is part of your service. The, the talents you have, whether you play an instrument or whether you can just smile at people, that's part of your service. And God gives us opportunities every day, inside and outside the church, to use what he's given us. It's maybe taking a meal to a new mom. Maybe praying for a neighbor or a coworker who's going through a rough time. And it could just be as simple as changing the diapers of someone else's kids in the church nursery. It's all of it. God is giving you the opportunity every day. And your time and talents and resources, those things that you have, sometimes we want to hold on tight to those things. But they were never meant to be just for you. They were meant to be given away. It's good. It's very practical, and it's also very relational. And that's what I think is really at the root of service. I enjoy doing things for my kids and my husband, right? I'm in relationship with them. I want to make sure they're happy. I want to make sure their you know, needs are taken care of. I also like to do fun things, you know? I, I enjoy surprising my husband with coffee sometimes. He might say I haven't done that recently, so. <laughs> but I do. I want to make sure, like, when he comes home at the end of the day, things are, things are nice so that he doesn't come home to a stressful environment. I want to make sure that my kids had a good day at school and how can I do things for them to make their day a little bit better. I'm in relationship with them and I want to serve them. So go back to the story of the little red hen for a second. See, her friends were just a little bit too lazy to help with the work, right? They definitely wanted in on the rewards. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, when they had their second chance, they jumped in and they helped and they, they got the rewards. Now, it's a little different with God. It's kind of like that. See, he loves us and he wants to share with us too. My husband Brad is a really good example. So Brad loves to bake, and every Christmas he bakes dozens of cookies. Every time we get new neighbors, he bakes cookies for them. And we have four boys, and each and every time he decides to bake cookies, he invites them to join in the process. So our oldest two, they usually don't. They, they want to go off doing something else. You know, that's fine. Um, but our third son, you see the picture up there, that's Mason. He loves to help bake. And so, you know, while the other two older boys go off and play, Mason washes his hands, he gets his stool, and he gets ready for the process. And then Brad instructs him, here's how, you know, the ingredients we need, and here's how you mix them together. And so each part of the way, Mason is doing the work and being a part of the process. And of course, the end results are delicious, fresh from the oven cookies. Now. Brad is very excited about his cookies, right? He can't wait to share them with people. Mason is excited. And of course they're best when they're fresh from the oven, right? So he, you know, offers Mason a fresh from the oven cookie to taste test. But he's a loving father. And of course the other boys smell the fresh baked cookies and they come running. Do you think that he tells the other boys, no, you didn't do the work, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you any? <laughs> I mean, he could, but he loves them, and he's excited about what, what he's done, and he wants to share with his kids, regardless of whether or not they did the work. Yeah. And that's a lot like how it is with God. See, he's not withholding his spiritual cookies. <laughs> he's not withholding the rewards. You have the love and the forgiveness and the salvation. It's yours for the taking. He freely gave it. Yeah. But... He'd much rather partner with you along the way in some of the work. Not the work you do to earn the rewards, but the work is just part of growing in the relationship. See, when Mason helps bake the cookies, he gets so much more than a cookie. He got the time with his dad, the quality time. Yeah. He also learned some new skills along the way and practiced them. 
But the important part was the quality time with his father. Good. And that is what our Heavenly Father is offering us when we partner with him. So see, I truly believe that the invitation today is not one from me to you. I don't think you need a desperate plea from me begging you to come help inside the church or begging you to invite your friends. You don't need a guilt trip. That's not what this is about. There's no guilt. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> See, it's all about the relationship. This is about your inner and self-reflection, your relationship with your father, yours. Because when you connect in your relationship, when you do that work, when you partner with him and you go deeper, you just want to do it more. Yeah. When you fall in love with Jesus for that first time or for the 100th time, it just it becomes natural. Service just becomes what you do. When you go all in, all of a sudden, you're in. It doesn't become a problem to invite your friends. You won't care if you look foolish asking somebody to pray, asking to pray for someone. You, you know, a stranger or friend, you're, you're open for it. You don't care if you're opening doors on a Sunday morning or, you know, the leader of the worship band. You don't care if you rearrange your entire Sunday to be here for two services because you are all in and you're willing to do what Jesus, whatever Jesus calls you to do. See, it won't be a problem anymore because your relationship and there will never be the phrase, that's not my job. You'll be ready to take on the role of a leader because you have the heart of a servant. Good. So the real invitation that we need here today is not me to you. It's not me inviting you to serve. Because you know you're invited. Mm -hmm. The real thing that's needed today is the one where you close your eyes and open your hearts and ask the Father to come. And so we're going to get ready to transition into worship time and I'm going to pray here. But as we do, I just um, ask you all to stand as the worship band comes up and gets ready. And as we stand and as we close this sermon today, this is a great time to just reflect and to open your hearts. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and just be in a position to receive. And I'm going to pray the prayer, but you can pray it for yourself too if it's what you feel, if it's what you want to do today. And it's simply just come Holy Spirit. God, we do invite you. You are invited here today to invade our hearts. You are invited to wreck our lives, to change the way we think. And God, I just pray that each person will just connect with you right now as we move into worship. God, that there's no guilt, there's no condemnation, it's just a time of self-reflection for each person. In Jesus' name, amen.